Good morning and welcome to Camp Hill Presbyterian Church. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent and we extend the grace and love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be with you this day. I do have a few announcements before we begin our worship. Uh, some prayer concerns that we would invite you to pray for. Uh, the grandmother Jean Henderson, grandmother of Betsy Onstad and Joe Harner passed away this week. So please keep them and their entire family in your prayers. Our custodian Keem's father also passed away this week, so he too would appreciate our prayers. And I would invite that if you have other prayer concerns that you uh, please call the church office and let us know so that we can lift them up here corporately each week. Um, you also should know that uh, we continue to be guided by the governor's uh, closing order. Um, so the building continues to be physically closed until April 6th. After that, uh, we uh, do know, not know what will happen. It seems, as we all know, that things are changing day by day and sometimes minute by minute. I can assure you that Easter and Holy Week services will happen. They may continue to be videotaped, but we will have those uh, services. We do have a pool of volunteers who are willing and able to pick up and deliver groceries and medication. Again, if you or someone you know, we are also partnering with the uh, Camp Hill Borough Emergency Management Services. Uh, and so if you know of neighbors, uh, to le please let us know as well or yourself should you need anything to please again call the uh, church office. It appears that the telephone is making a comeback so if you know of folks who are without the benefit of technology uh, please remind them that they can uh, still call the office and uh, get information and also the worship service uh, in a hard form. Uh, Anne did prayer fellowship this morning via conference call, and that went well. S the Lenten study also, though it, it is by Zoom, um, you do not need to have a computer to participate. You simply can get the uh, telephone number from the office and participate um, from home on your telephone. Uh, in addition, the same is for pastoral care. If you uh, are in need of pastoral care, or just want to talk, please feel free to call Anne, uh, Dan, or myself, and we'd be happy to uh, speak with you. Those are all our announcements. Let us now uh, hear our call to worship. Let us be called to worship now with these words. Let us worship God who has done great things we rejoice in our God who made a way through the desert of this world. We worship God who has called, who has caused streams of mercy to flow in the wasteland. We praise God for the grace that he has given us. Alleluia, we rejoice. Let us join together now in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, as we worship you today, we long for your spirit to both comfort and challenge us and to help us become more loving. In a world that does not understand repentance, we pray for new understanding, humility, patience, and discipline that will help us die to sin and live for Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ, the grace. 
Let us join together now for prayer. Let us pray. Lord, many of us gather this morning with heavy hearts. We are distracted by the bad news of the day, which is focused on the coronavirus and COVID-19, and we are understandably worried. We ask, Lord, that for this time, we would focus on good news, that you would take that which distracts us away from us, and through your spirit, our hearts and minds would be focused on the good news that we hear in scripture this day from the prophet Isaiah and the Gospel of John. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray, amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from the prophet Isaiah. I'll be reading from chapter 53, verses one through seven. A word of introduction about this passage in the um, uh, book of Isaiah, there are four pieces of scripture that are known as the suffering servant songs. Isaiah 53 is the fourth suffering song, suffering servant song. And here the prophet tells us that suffering is required and what that suffering will look like. Those of us who call ourselves Christian read into this passage a description of our Lord Jesus Christ and indeed in all of the suffering servant psalms. Let us listen now for the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, tr crushed by our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture of reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter, beginning at the 38th verse. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, 
And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This too is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. For those of you who may be visiting with us today on the internet, we would have you know that at the beginning of this season of Lent, we started a series of sermons called Faces at the Cross. This series of sermons was based on the book by preacher and poet Barry Shepard and his book entitled Faces at the Cross. Today I read to you his writing, his reflection on the face of Joseph of Arimathea. Generations now it has been in the possession of, of our family and yet Strange to tell, no one has ever used that cave. Came to us through marriage at the very first, or so I heard. I seem to remember the setting is rather an attractive one, a quiet, shaded garden near the outskirts of the city. I must choose my moment carefully to get Pilate while the guilt still lingers, yet before Caiaphas can present some dreadful scheme of his own for the disposal of the body. The governor is like jelly, swayed by whomever has spoken to him last and terrified of turmoil of anything indeed that might reflect back to Rome upon his incompetence or fitness for his post. Perhaps if Nicodemus will join me in this overture, the proposal will carry more weight. I wasn't the only one, after all, among the influential older families to be a secret follower, to find in the Nazarean teacher all that I had been searching for as long as I can remember. There were others. I caught glimpses of them around the fringes of the crowds. There are even some among us who gave dinner parties in his honors and sought him out in private sessions, brought loved ones to him to be healed or tried to at first before it became too dangerous to bend the thinking of their colleagues, even of the high Sanhedrin, in Jesus' favor. But the high priest and his party would have none of it couldn't see beyond their fear for their own personal possessions and hereditary privilege to the truth that Jesus taught, to that profound yet simple wisdom he distilled from the scriptures and from the world in which we live. I wonder why he threatened them so much. He never said those things they charged him with, never talked of toppling Rome or tearing down the temple stone by stone. It was as if they tried to hear him wrongly, as if they listened to his words, not at all for what they said, but for what, but for what they might be made to say, might be twisted into saying to condemn him. Were they simply jealous of his influence with the common folk? Did they fear his miracle-working powers? Or were they just offended by the simplicity and clear truth of everything he said, especially when compared to their own contrived and convoluted teachings? Were they afraid because they actually heard the word of God in what he said and saw the hand of God in all he did? so that he judged them just by being who he was. Or perhaps they judged themselves against him and couldn't live with what they found so that someone had to go. You are the salt of the earth. I can remember Jesus saying, as if even a few of us 
could add a zest and flavor to the whole of life might yet transform it. You are the light of the world, he told us. Is there any way that I could shed even a single solitary ray of light into this deep, seemingly impenetrable dark? Such an act of boldness and courage to walk right into Pilate's court and ask for the body of Jesus. Under Roman law, crucified criminals were not permitted to be buried. Their bodies were left on the cross to suffer even more humiliation after death. Being a secret disciple of Jesus, this rich Jewish man, Joseph of Arimathea, is determined to provide Jesus a proper burial. You might remember that he and Nicodemus were members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, made up of the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. It was the final court of appeals for matters of the law of Moses. And it was the Sanhedrin who convicted Jesus of blasphemy, which was punishable by stoning. But since they didn't have the power to carry out that punishment, members of the Sanhedrin manipulated Pilate into convicting Jesus of treason which was punishable by crucifixion. Luke tells us that Joseph of Arimathea and presumably Nicodemus did not consent to that decision of the Sanhedrin, but neither did they voice their dissent, choosing instead to remain silent preferring to remain an anonymous disciple of Jesus for fear of losing their position on the high court. That gives us pause to wonder what difference might it have made to Jesus if among all the voices of hate and condemnation, among all the cries of crucify him, Jesus had heard just one word of support or saw someone who had the guts to stand up to those religious leaders and confront their lies, challenge their deceit. But instead, Joseph said nothing. And he stood by and watched all the horrible events of Jesus' last week on earth. But then watching how Jesus died on the cross changed everything for Joseph. Standing at the foot of the cross, he witnessed a man whose passion for the kingdom of God and those within it had cost him his life. As we heard him say just a few minutes ago, Joseph now saw how the truth that Jesus taught, the love which Jesus shared, threatened those who dared to teach others how to follow God. Those who clung with tight fists to their ancient ways and their well-worn traditions. So much so that they failed to see the dawning of God's new day in the one who is the light of the world. 
Joseph knew he too had been following in the shadows rather than walking in that dawning light. Seeing Jesus on the cross, he remembered all those times he heard Jesus say that anyone who stops to count the cost of following me cannot really be counted among my disciples. In our monologue, we heard his moment of conviction when he said, you are the light of the world. Jesus told us, is there any way I can shed even a single solitary ray of light into this deep, seemingly impenetrable darkness? So while most of Jesus' disciples, who had publicly declared themselves to be so, fled and hid after Jesus was arrested, Joseph finds his courage to be the first one to come out of the dark and into the light of day and declare himself to be a follower of Jesus to Pontius Pilate, an act of bravery that could easily have cost him his life as that same angry crowd that turned against Jesus could possibly have turned against him. At the very least, his actions would have cost him his membership on the Supreme Court. He would also have been rendered unclean and defiled for touching a dead body and excommunicated from the temple. And then Joseph even broke Jewish law by burying Jesus in a family grave because, as I said, criminals were not allowed to be buried. Honoring Jesus with a proper burial cost Joseph the life he had known before he had become a follower of his Lord and Savior. So too, when we take our rightful place at the foot of the cross, like Joseph, we see again Jesus' sacrificial love poured out for us and for the life of our world. And we see again the cost of our discipleship. That is what it might and often does cost us to follow our Lord in offering loving service to the world as we cooperate with the grace that he gives us. In the immortal words of theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he writes, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is like the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a person will go and sell all that they have. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a person their life. And it is grace because it gives a person the only life worth living. We hear this morning our own Lenten invitation resonating from Je Joseph's own. We are the light of the world. In these dark times, is there any way we can shed even a single solitary ray of light? 
as we have made this journey to the cross. We have laid down our sorrow, trusting that as our tears are commingled with God's own tears, they become the healing waters of redemption and the flowing stream of resurrection joy. And we've offered up our hearts, asking that they be purified, that our speech might be more constructive than destructive. We've laid down our shame that entangles us and our lives in the knots of our own making, that Jesus might set us free. We've released our fear so as be, to be filled with the rock-solid love and faithfulness of our God providing us with the great gift of courage. This morning we come to the cross and we offer up and renew our costly discipleship as we hear the echoes of our Lenten hymn. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. At the foot of the cross on your behalf, we have a net filled with the symbol of the fish that those early disciples and apostles used to identify themselves boldly to the world, that they were courageous followers of Jesus. So as that net is filled with a multitude of fish, we jointly offer and recommit ourselves to be the church of Jesus Christ not stopping to count the cost. As we continue to share and shed the light of Christ into what seems at time the impenetrable darkness of our world. Amen. Having offered our lives back to God, let us go to God, thankful for the gift of life and our ability to share that life with others. Let us pray. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God who is with us yesterday, today, and forever, on the pilgrimage of our lives. We pray you might continue to walk beside us. Open our eyes, open our hearts to your presence amongst us. We thank you this day especially for those who have gone before us, those martyrs of our faith who suffered for their faith those who shared their faith with others, that we too might become disciples of Christ. We thank you for all your servants who live now and forever in the light of the risen Christ. Almighty God, we pray this day for our country and for our world. as we continue to battle disease. We pray this morning for all the churches and faithful who are gathered in your name, that we would continue to be the church throughout the world. Make us even one in our faith, our witness, and our work that in these times our witness may be more convincing our service may be more effective. As we ask that you would make us instruments of your peace, 
agents of your justice and reconciliation, and bearers of hope. Oh God of great compassion, we do pray for all those who are suffering this day. May they hear that message that they have a Lord who knows human suffering, a Lord whose compassion flows from how God continued to care for him even in those moments of his own suffering and death. We pray for those who are ill, whether it be in body, mind, or spirit, we lift before you, especially Dan Doherty, Nancy Travitz, all those on our prayer list who continue to seek your healing and wholeness. So we pray that healing power might be poured out upon them, that your sustaining grace and love might be a source of support and strength and consolation. We pray for those, O oh God, who are isolated in these days, those who live alone and now are separated from family and friends, that they might feel your companionship sustaining them, and through the moderns of technology that they will feel community surrounding them We pray, O oh God, that you would continue to bring us the gift of light and hope in the midst of every circumstance, knowing that you are working in them and through them by your grace and bringing new life and new joy into our lives and hearts. We pray for all those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, especially for Betsy and Joe and their entire family in the loss of their grandmother, and Keem and his entire family in the loss of his father. We are mindful more than ever at this time of year, O oh God, in the great promise of Easter that death is not the end of our lives, but only the beginning of a new life with you. And though our loved ones are no longer with us now, we entrust them into your loving care and know that we will see them again. In the silence, O oh God, we lift before you the prayer of grace we need most this day. God, in your gracious love and wisdom and power, hear our prayers, answer them in your will and in your time. And as we wait, grant us the patience we need. We pray all these things, O oh God, trusting in your goodness and in your mercy because we have seen it in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And so with the boldness and courage and confidence as his followers, we do pray that prayer he taught us, as with one voice we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into the time of temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank you uh, for continuing to uh, play, pay your pledge either online 
or by sending it to the church offering to the church office. So we're going to take a moment now just to uh, dedicate all of those offerings um, virtually as we again continue to be uh, the church uh, without a building, but necessary uh, for sure the church as a community of faith. So let us pray. Gracious and most loving God, as we now dedicate our lives again to you in the way of sacrificial love and costly discipleship, we pray that you would continue to accept the resources of our lives, that they may be used for the furtherance of the coming of your kingdom, of love and justice, mercy and peace, that we would be your people and that we would continue to be redeemed in all the ways that you are working within this world to bring your, wor your work to fruition and in your time to fulfillment. We ask this in Christ's name, amen. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God's Holy Spirit abide with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen.